Hello, and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Anne Kruijt, and I'm the host for today's talk. And if you're participating in the live webinar, you can submit questions or comments in the chat module of the Zoom application at any time during the presentation, or you can ask a voice question by raising your hand once the presentation is complete. Today's speaker is Nina van der Vlucht. Nina is a research master student at Leiden University, where she specializes in the description of African languages, and she works as an editorial assistant for the Journal of African Languages and Linguistics. She is particularly interested in the intersection of linguistics and other research disciplines like anthropology and genetics. Please join me in welcoming Nina as she gives her talk, Hatsa History from an Interdisciplinary Perspective. Nina, go ahead. Thanks a lot for the introduction, Anne, and many thanks to you all for being here today. Um, I'll talk to you about a topic that has fascinated me for a long time now, uh, namely the history of the Hatsa. This research is still ongoing and it focuses on uh, combining lines of research and seeing what we can learn from an interdisciplinary approach and if this can lead us to new insights. Um, I won't be able to see the chat now, but we can come back to any comments during the discussion part. I'll firstly briefly introduce the Hatsa people, uh, which leads to the research focus and methods. Then I'll discuss evidence from linguistics as well as genetics and conclude with some comments on taking an interdisciplinary approach and the expected results. So the Hatsa live in northern Tanzania around Lake Ayasi, and their language is seen as a language isolate, which I'll come back to in a bit. There are languages from other African language families spoken in this area, which is what you see on the map here, uh, the language, languages of the northern Tanzanian Rift Valley. And there are about a thousand Hatsa speakers. Um, the Hatsa have lived as hunter gatherers in the past, and some of them still do. They speak a click language, which is cross linguistically rare. And inside and outside academia, um, both their language and lifestyle have, have attracted a lot of fascination. Um, the Hatsa people, language and lifestyle would supposedly reflect the life of lives of the earliest contemporary humans in Africa. And a lot of this research has been based on stereotypes, um, which we'll come back to later as well. Um, but photos like these are not uncommon in reportings of the Hatsa, um, which often solely focus on their hunter-gather lifestyle and add to this stereotypical portrayal. Um, much of the research findings of work on Hatsa stay within the discipline in which research has been carried out, um, which leads us to the next questions. What happens if we combine these different lines of research? And what does an interdis interdisciplinary approach tell us about the history of the Hatsa? And could this potentially give us a new perspective? To find answers to these questions, I'm not gathering new data, uh, but I'll be reviewing research already carried out and combining these results for a comprehensive overview of what we know of the Hatsa. Today, I'll focus on findings of linguistic and genetic research, and I'll identify relevant points. And most importantly, I will reflect on these findings. In the final research, I'll also include results from archaeology and ecology. So as I'm sure you're all aware, there's much that can be said on the linguistic side. But for the sake of the presentation, I'll highlight uh, only a few of these works. Hatsa has been previously classified as a Khoisan language, together with Sandawe, which is also spoken in Tanzania, and some languages in southern Africa. Uh, the latter are illustrated on the map here. Greenberg has proposed the Khoisan language family in his 1963 work, The Languages of Africa. And most commonly seen nowadays, Khoisan languages do not form a single language family. As many of you will be aware, Greenberg mainly based his proposal on the presence of cliques, which are cross-linguistically rare as phonemes, but they do occur in these languages as phonemes, and some of the Khoisan languages also share geographical proximity. Work that has since taken place has shown that similarities between these languages of this proposed family are likely due to language contact. And thanks to the elaborate work of Bonnie Sands, Hatsa is nowadays recognized to be a language isolate. And the Southern African clique languages are still referred to as Khoisan, although the three lineages recognized are likely independent of each other. Um, this is also the use of Khoisan I'll be using in this presentation, um, meaning the Southern African click languages that are not Bantu languages I should have. So when it comes to the genetic research, um, I'll highlight two genetic studies today. And please note that different genetic research suggests different genetic relations for the Hatsa depending on what markers are used, as well as what populations are sampled. 
Today I focus on two, but there are, for example, also research researchers that suggest that Hadza share ancestry with the Central African foragers. I'll address this later as well. So how does genetic research work? Genetic research is focused on genes and the characteristics associated with them. Ge genetic information is passed on from one generation to the next. And if you study the genes of a, on, a, on a population level, you can study the variation found in these genes within the groups of individuals. And you can then compare these genes of one population to those of another population. And the tendency in genetic research is that populations that are more remote in terms of geography and ancestry will diverge more in terms of their genes. Things like mutation, migration, or genetic drift influence variations in a gene. And this means for us that DNA will inherently change over time. And the longer two groups of humans are apart, the more they will diverge in terms of DNA um, if they were once connected. And as, as the Hadza and Khoisan both speak a click language and have or have had a hunter-gatherer lifestyle, the DNA of these populations has been compared in genetic research. And Sandawe, another click language spoken in Tanzania, is often also included in this type of research. Again, if the populations would have been connected to each other in the past, you could expect similarities between their DNAs. So you can, for example, study the Y chromosome and mitochondrial DNA, um, the Y chromosome, is passed down from father to son, mitochondrial DNA from mother to offspring. And one of the studies I want to highlight today is that of Schwinner et al. Um, one of their remarks is interesting for us, and uh, namely that they find Hatsa ancestry closer to Amadic ancestry uh, than to Khoisan ancestry. So they then say, taken together, or genetic findings support a philolinguistic philolingu hypothesis that Omotic and Hadza languages form a language family, and they follow Elderkin's 1982 suggestion for this. They also suggest this as a possibility for Sandawe. Um, so what they say is, because Hadza people are genetically more similar to Omotic people than to Khoisan people, this might support the existing linguistic hypothesis of Elderkin. And then when we go to look at the work of Tishkov and colleagues, they also have similar or they also have very interesting findings. Um, they explain that Southern African Khoisan speakers and Hadza and Sandawi speakers share ancient mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosome haplogroups, and that all three populations share an ancient haplogroup that is rare elsewhere. This common ancestry would date back more than 35,000 years ago. Um, they also explain that, that Hadza and Sandawi are more genetically similar to their Nilotic, Cushitic, and Bantu-speaking neighbors than they are to Southern African Khoisan-speaking populations. Um, but they also note that Hadza and Sandawe are genetically are more gen genetically similar to these Southern African Khoisan po populations than any of the other Tanzanian populations. This means that the Hadza, Sandawe, and Southern African Khoisan speakers share common ancestry, but that both Hadza and Sandawe are more similar to the speakers of neighboring languages in the Rift Valley. Um, however, if you then take the DNA of more Tanzanian populations into account, the Hadza and Sandawe are more similar to Khoisan speakers than these other Tanzanian populations are to Khoisan speakers. And this is a good point to say that, be mindful that I as a linguist might not be able to interpret the genetic data to their full potential. For the final analysis, I'll consult with a geneticist to, for example, judge the data on sample size and methods and reliability, because that's simply impossible for me as a, gene as a linguist to do. So in the work I have done so far, similar themes keep coming back. And one of these themes is the origin of clicks. Much of the work on the Hadza and other groups of hunter-gatherers has been informed by stereotypes attached to their lifestyle. And in the case of Africa, uh, click languages. And there are two relevant points here. The first being the acquisition of clicks. There are three ways of a linguistic feature like clicks to spread. Firstly, clicks can be a retention of a proto language, which means that they are then inherited. And secondly, clicks can be acquired through contact with other languages. Bantu languages in Southern Africa are a good example of this. We cannot reconstruct clicks to proto Bantu, and clicks are present in the Khoisan languages spoken in the same area, so they have spread due to contact. And thirdly, 
clicks can also develop independently. An example of this that's often given is a, a special register of ritual speech in the Australian language Damin. And note that we are talking of phonemic clicks here, not extra linguistic clicks. Extra linguistic clicks occur in many languages. Um, in the case of click languages, researchers have mostly considered the first scenario where clicks are inherited. And why this is the case is nicely summarized, summarized by Goldman and Stone King in their 2008 article. And they say this about Goizen, but the logic is applicable to the Hatsatu. So they say, because Goizen groups are among the oldest genetically, because most groups are hunter-gatherers, and this associated with the oldest subsistence patterns of our species, and because all their languages are characterized by cliques, cliques must also be an old feature of language. Notice that this is often based on stereotypes and assumptions, not on data-informed research. And this is problematic for a few reasons. Firstly, as, as Samson Goldman point out, this would mean that click languages are highly conservative in if they were to have originated at the start of language development. Um, whilst there's no reason to assume that clicks are more or less conservative, conservative than any other linguistic feature. And secondly, the case of clicks in Hatsa does not necessarily suggest a case of inheritance, um, but could also match with a scenario of language conduct or independent variation. It matches with all the scenarios possible. And this does not mean that click retention is impossible for Hatsa. It just means that we do not know how Hatsa acquired its clicks at this point. And a second point I want to make on the origin of clicks concerned, concerns when exactly they were acquired. Um, following the logic just explained in a retention scenario, clicks would supposedly be as ancient as the populations that spoke them. Um, however, there is no linguistic evidence that could go that clicks go back to a language at the start of language evolu evolution. And you now also run into different time depths used in different disciplines, which I'll reflect on shortly. And moreover, several authors argue that clicks might have emerged later in the development of human speech. So this is all important to keep in mind with regards to the origin of clicks. And if we then turn to genetic evidence, from a linguistic point of view, genetics seems to be more precise than linguistics in terms of dating. And this is, of course, true. Um, genetic evidence is extremely promising, and it opens up a lot of new research. Um, but from the discussion of genetic research, on the Hatsa by Nietzsche 2020, it becomes clear that depending on both the marker you choose for research and the populations you compare, you can end up with conflicting genetic evidence. This is just to say that carefulness is needed in interpretation and you can't simply use one marker, um, but genetic research is still very valuable and interesting. Um, also, the Hatsa nowadays are a small population from about 1000 speakers small populations tend to lose genetic diversity quicker. So what we find in genetic research today might not represent a full story. And a lot of genetic researchers suggest that uh, the Hatsa could have had a recent population bottleneck, um, which means a, re a drastic reduce reduction in the size of a population, um, which also reduces their genetic diversity. If we look at how data is used between sciences, um, an important point here is the understanding of these data. Much of this revolves around how you use this and how you can interpret their findings, the findings of different sciences in a correct way if you are not an expert in this respective field. So if you have ever read a genetic, genetic, genetics paper as a linguist, um, you might have had trouble understanding it. If not, I'd be very impressed. Um, but it is perfectly understandable that I, as a linguist, might not be able to correctly or fully collect correctly interpret the findings of genetic research without the background necessary to understand this. And being aware of these pitfalls is very important. And this also links to what arguments you can make with what type of data. As Sensen Goldman in notes about their about clicks in their 29 article, what click languages can and can't tell us about language origins. A linguistic hypothesis must be proven and tested with linguistic data and not with biological genetic data. And as just explained, time depth is regarded as very different in these two disciplines. What is seen as old in linguistics is recent in genetics, and what is considered old in genetics is something anyone interested in historical linguistics could only dream of reconstructing. 
Then there are two examples, which I think highlight the, um, highlight the points I would like to make today. Um, the first is with regards to the categories or the labels we use, particularly the term Khoisan is relevant here. This really is a term you would like to see specified in any article given its history. Um, Matthew nicely made some interesting comments on category use in his talk um, at the same webinar series, explaining how the categories of Hatsa and Sandawe have come about and how categorizations can both aid or hold back research. Um, and a similar point is made by Andrew Harvey and Richard Griscom in their talk, Who are the Hatsa? And then secondly, in the work of Schwinner and colleagues, they find that Hatsa speakers share DNA with Amadic speakers. And they then tentatively propose that this could support a linguistic hypothesis of Elderkin, namely that Hatsa is related to Amadic or to Amadic languages. If you are familiar with Elderkin's paper, you might know that he discusses several options with regard to the origin of Hatsa, and that it's a very exploratory paper and it doesn't present nowhere, like the things he, he suggests are nowhere near established. And using genetic findings to support a non-established linguistic hypothesis might not be the most fruitful way to go about it because what you're then really doing is matching your data to, to your, you match your data to what you find in your own research discipline. Which leads me directly to my next point that languages do not equal genes in any way, shape or form. Um, we've already touched upon this earlier, but it's good to say it again that Genes are more stable in a way that languages simply are not. Languages can change and get lost without leaving a genetic trace. And Hassa ancestry might well be closer to Omotic ancestry than Khoisan ancestry. This does not mean that Hassa and Omotic people come from a common ancestor. Um, and contact or intermarriage could also account for this. And especially for the implications this has for linguistics. This is really good to understand, especially for other disciplines. Um, then I would want to highlight some good practices I've seen um, in understanding the data shared in or between sciences. Terminology and concepts will need to be specified in this type of, in this type of research um, to even be understandable for outsiders and for non-experts of the field. And some of the research I've seen, they explain termino terminological use in a footnote or in Goldman and Sunking 28, they explain these in the margins of the paper, which for both linguistic and genetic concepts, which is extremely useful. And then finally, I would wanna make clear that it's very easy to look back on the past research and single out the areas for improvement, um, but it is only that we can break away from the stereotypes that have formed and from these assumptions because of, because of this earlier work. Um, however flawed in some aspects today, it's still very valuable because it allows us to build on it and move away from it in this case. It does show very well how important it is to work with data and not with assumptions and also to challenge your own beliefs as a researcher, I think. So with what's to come, the next stages of research will focus on incorporating findings from archaeological and e ecological research. And if all data is gathered, there will be a final stage of research focusing on collaboration with people from all involved, field, involved fields. And I think this is the only way to overcome some of the challenges or shortcomings um, explained, just explained. And then rounding off the talk and coming back to my original question, what does an interdisciplinary approach tell us about the Hatsa? So my research is still ongoing, as you know, but I hope it will result in a new perspective on what we know about the Hatsa as it combines, combines research findings and it gives a new state of the art overview of the Hatsa. I hope it can also specify what each discipline can and cannot add to interdisciplinary research like this. Um, and an interdisciplinary approach leads to new insights that would otherwise not even have been possible, specifically because each discipline has both limitations and possibilities and in this way, they can also complement each other. And finally, hopefully, this will result in new avenues for research. Interdisciplinary research is not a final stage whatsoever. It's really the start of much more research to come. That being said, thank you so much for your attention. 
attention and for the invitation to speak here today. Um, I'm very happy to answer any, any questions and hear any suggestions or remarks you might have. Thank you very much, Nina, for the interesting presentation. Uh, with that, we can start the question and answer section. It will be open to voice questions as well as written questions, as always. If you write it in the chat, I will read it out. Um, otherwise, please raise your hands uh, in the participant panel and I will send you a request to unmute. Please remember that the webinars are being recorded so that if you ask a question, this will be part of the recording and will be released in the YouTube channel. I think Bonnie was the first one with her hand up, so I'll go straight to her. And I'll just uh, stop the screen share so I can see the people and uh, the chat as well now. Yeah. Anna Maria was first, actually. Ah, okay, sorry. Um, then I'll go there first. Oh, Bonnie, you could have asked first. Thank you. No, Nina, this was a, it's a lovely, lovely topic um, coming from the two um, disciplines you talked about, genetics and linguistics. Uh, I'm really, really very fond of your research. I think it's a very, I like very much that you're so open minded because uh, I'm always a bit scared that these talks, um, multidisciplinary talks, are very often either linguists bashing geneticists or the geneticists starting to bash the awful linguists with their terminological. <laughs> chaos. So it was really nice uh, to see a different approach. Um, if you're interested, I could point you to some more papers because uh, the Tishkov is pretty outdated because she uses a very small number of SNPs of, um, of parts of the genome. So we now use much bigger chunks, much bigger sequences, including full genomes. And uh, the, um, the other paper you cited is awful <laughs> in its conclusion. I'm sorry, it's a really awful paper. But, I didn't want to say it like that, but yes. Well, it's an awful paper, even from, uh, I read it some years ago and I, I thought, no. But uh, there has been some very interesting work on comparing also Southern African and Eastern African click speakers uh, using more markers, especially also in the KBA project. All these papers by uh, Barbieri, Pickrell et al., they also include later, you may want to look at that. And uh, there's a quite recent paper on ancient DNA um, Skoglund, which I can send you, I can also explain it to you because it's a bit tricky maybe. And this basically shows that the Hatsa indeed do preserve something that is could be said is a um, pre-agricultural East African hunter-gatherer component. Um, and it's again something that is very old, has nothing to do with the clicks and so on, but it sort of shows that um, they may preserve some features in their genome, not in their lifestyle, not in their language, but maybe as a population that, as you said nicely, underwent a bottleneck um, that um, preserves something that is interesting also from a multidisciplinary perspective and makes them special in a way. So they are special. They are not just like their neighbors. So, uh, and about the language, obviously, I mean, you have uh, East Southern African Khoisan speakers uh, hunter gather with strong hunter gatherer identities like the Kwe or the Damara, and they are genetically almost fully Bantu. I mean, so, so this, there is sometimes um, a disconnection, but it's also interesting to, to reflect a bit what does it mean if you have in some groups, like for example, in the Jutra, you have sort of an overlap between genes and languages and, and in some groups you don't. So this tells you about contact. This uh, All of this is a sort of a, a really interesting approach. And uh, yeah, also if you would like to speak about the genetics of at some point, you can always contact me and uh, I can maybe help you out a bit if you're interested. Thank you so much for all your comments. Yes, I would totally love that. Um, and I'm also very interested in the references. I'm aware of some of the works, um, but please, if you could email them to me, that'd be amazing. Um, I've written down everything you said, so I'll look into it, but thank you so much. And we stay in touch. Thank you for inviting me. That was really cool. Thank you. And since no one else has their hand up, uh, if it's all right, Nina, I've got a uh... Three comments. I, I I wanted to let Anna Maria make the genetics comments, but when I read the Shriner at all, it's like when I see someone making a poor conclusion, like basing, saying they can make a language claim based on DNA, it's like I, I already don't trust their methodology for their DNA studies. <laughs> that's just, <laughs> even though I'm not a geneticist, that's, there are little clues how to evaluate these things. So, so my first comment is, um, Although my work sort of said that Greenberg was wrong, I think we have to be a little bit fairer to Greenberg. He didn't just say the language has a looks related because there are clicks. He actually thought he found cognates and sound correspondences. 
So I, I think you should make that clear and, and not, not be quite so unfair to him. I mean, yeah. No, that's a I good think, point. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. And then my second linguistics point on your, on your table of origin of clicks, are that, is it retention? Um, what was it? Was it independent? Was it contact? Was it independent innovation? Yes. I want you to, under retention, consider two possibilities, monogenetic origin, polygenetic origin. So Hadza could have retained clicks, but it still didn't mean that it was related to other click languages. So just, just to make that clear, because yes, that of idea of retention sort of seemed to carry the implication that, that clicks only yes. had one origin. No, that's a very good point. Yeah, I'll make sure to think of that. Yeah. And then my third point is, um, I wonder if you want to relabel your talk as about prehistory as opposed to history, because the Hadza do have a lot of history and yeah. some of that is is discussed in um, Blurton Jones's book. He has a chapter on history, a lot of which was based on some unpublished papers by McDowell, which I believe are in the Rift Valley bibliography. Here, let me, I'll put them in the chat. And if not, I can send you PDFs of those. And also, um, for instance, considering um, um, Andrew Madsen's book, uh, you know, so it's not that the Hadza don't have history. So when you start immediately jumping to genetics, I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute, what about their history? What about their history of famines, their history of interaction with the Hanzu and such? So um, yeah, it just, just because that sort of, again, plays into the idea that hunter-gatherers don't have history, which and of course- that is what we would want to avoid. So that's a very important comment. Thank you for pointing that yeah. out. Yes. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for the overview. I see Anna Maria has a comment in the chat. Uh, yeah, I see that as well. Um, would you like to, would you like me to read it out, Anna Maria, or would you like to just explain it? Um, sorry, I'm three screens at the same time. I'll just read it out, I think. Um, so she says about the clicks in Southern and Eastern Africa, she agrees with Vani about Greenberg, plus it has been shown quite recently by ecology that there are very ancient links between Eastern and Southern Africa. So clicks may very well be a relic of an old context area which was interrupted at some point in history. Of course, it does not mean that clicks trace back to some human proto-language, but it may mean that clicks in Africa are not totally independent either. Um, then I see that Mary Prendergast has raised her hand, so I'll... Yourself, Mary. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I was saying I couldn't do. Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, thanks so much, Nina. That was really interesting. I just wanted to jump in and say, first of all, I agree with everything that's been said about the genetics work. There's actually a couple other ancient DNA papers, both existing and one that should come out in a few weeks that I think would be useful to you. So I can send those to you if you don't have them. Um, and I can also sort of talk to you about the caveats. Sorry, my dog. Of, of all the genetic research as well. Um, and sort of where, where there's a lot of assumptions or jumps that are made when data points are few, especially with ancient DNA. And then, oh, I'm gonna pick him up, sorry. And the other thing I want to say is I know that you didn't have time to get into the archeology span of that area, um, but I've worked quite a bit in that area or I did a long time ago for my PhD and just there's so many gaps. It's extremely difficult to relate the archeological record to a history of the Hadza, as Bonnie is saying. I mean, there's there's also some history besides in Blurton Jones, there's um, in Frank Marlowe's book, there's a chapter about material culture, which you've probably seen, that has some references to sort of items used by the Hadza in, in the oral historical past, but it's really pretty difficult. And every now and then one of these people who works with the Hadza sends me pictures of artifacts they find and they're like, oh, these are, you know, Hadza tools. And I'm like, well, maybe, or maybe they're 3000 years old. So there's just huge gaps in the, in the Mongola area um, archeological record. There's a real lack of any solid chronology. And I'm just saying, I'd be happy to talk to you about it at any point if you, if you want. Yeah, that'd be amazing. Thank you so much for offering. That sounds very useful. Then I see that Marta's raised his hand. Yes, I raised my hand. Um, um, yeah, how do I put this? I, I wonder what the role you see for historical scenarios when you try to compare um, the results from, from disciplines. 
when I worked on the history of Tumbugo, I was at first trying to stay away from formulating possible scenarios of what happened. And, and then I got in a discussion, Sarah Tormason, who told me, you know, you really, you, you, you will have to come up with something. You have to come up with possible scenarios and, and, and then discuss the, the likelihood of the different ones. And so I wonder how, how you, you didn't speak about, well, possible scenarios when you discussed the, the connections, the, um, the suggested connections between Omotok and Hadza, but do you think that that's a dangerous, uh, uh, and maybe question to all of you, a, a dangerous path to go or an unavoidable path to go to to propose scenarios and then wait the different, uh, the different the different scenarios. Um, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, and super nice that you're joining from Tanzania today. Um, I've thought about this also, and I'm not sure what direction the paper will go in, um, in like in its final stage. Um, because my first instinct, like yours was, is to kind of stay away from that. Um, because I think it's very difficult to judge this data if you're not familiar, fully familiar with the history and everything. Um, and I'm not sure if I would be the right person to make those claims or suggestions. Um, on the other hand, that's of course what you would want to work towards um, if you're making this more extensive picture of the prehistory as we're calling it now. Um, thank you, Bonnie. So yeah. I'm not sure. I think that's a really good question. I'd be really interested to hear what other people would say about that. Ah, there we go, Anna Maria. So just to quickly comment on the hypothesis question, I mean, as an individual, I would always refrain from making big hypotheses because in the end, I am a linguist. And even though I understand the genetics data quite OK, I guess, um, I think that true hypothesis can only be made in interaction. I think it's not enough to just say, uh, uh, I'm a linguist, I look up the genetic data, or I'm a geneticist who is quite okay versed in reading the linguistic data. I think in the end, um, this really needs a, a true collaboration where people sit together, explain to each other what is the data they have, possibly also bring the data into a format that can be compared where the computation and the bioinformatics and the computational linguistics and so on comes in. This is now often called triangulation. There is some people that work on that. There has recently been a paper, I think, in Nature or in Science, uh, where this has been applied to a family called transuration, which is very disputed, obviously, but at least these are people that uh, were trying to work together. And there has, of course, been this Kalahari Basin Area project, which brought together linguists and geneticists. Uh, I think it's really important that these hypotheses about big his uh, historical events are formulated uh, in collaboration and not just by a single individual or a group of individuals by a single discipline. And this obviously goes also out to the geneticists, right? Because they throw out their big papers with, with claims like, uh, uh, we prove that Hatsa is homotic, or we prove that the Nilo-Saharan family exists, or we prove that the human proto-language had clicks, and all of this is obviously nonsense. But they put, they come up with these things and they make a paper in science and science says, ah, oh, this sounds kicky, let's publish this. So I think in the end, the linguists also need to be a bit more daring to shove themselves into these discussions and say, ah, here I am, listen to me. So yeah, but uh, I think we as linguists should also be more daring, but not in the same way that I guess some geneticists are daring. Thanks a lot for your comment. I totally agree. Uh, I see that Jeroen has also raised his hand. Oh. Yeah, hey Nina. Uh, thanks so much for the talk. It was super interesting and very impressive what you did. I just love how nuanced everything is and that you're not rushing to conclusions, but that you're evaluating everything uh, very patiently and being very careful with everything because that's the most important thing here. Um, at the end, you mentioned that you're going to also look at um, like connecting ecology to this. And I was wondering, um, yeah, what that implies and how you're gonna do that. Yeah, very good question. Um, I also thought if I should explain this or not in the presentation. Um, 
but it's interesting to see. So, okay, we know that the the dots have likely always for so with what I've read so far that the dots have always been in this area. Um, but I think that ecology is really interesting to see how populations could move or where they would want to go or how that has changed, uh, because what we see today might not always have been the ecological landscape um, always. Um, so I think it's really interesting to see what perspective that can bring into this as well um, and how that might add to, um, well, how it connects to everything really. Um, but yeah, to make more interesting comments on this, I, I would really need to be more versed in that um, line of research, which I am not yet at this point. Sorry, I couldn't un unmute myself, but thanks for your answer. <laughs> yeah, and also I was wondering um, uh, how culture plays a role in this. Like, can you also compare um, cultural aspects, like how people interact, um, not necessarily on a linguistic level, but for example, how they raise their children, uh, how to build their houses, if that's something um, where maybe also some comparisons lie with other people's, maybe that's more influenced by contact, but I'm not sure. How will you evaluate that? Yeah, that's a really interesting point. Um, I, what I, it makes me think of um, a talk of Richard and um, Andrew of how that how there are many more Hatsa speakers if you let people self-identify um, as opposed to count them as a linguistic unit, for example. Um, I haven't looked into this, but I'll definitely take this into account. If someone else has any interesting comment to make about this, I'd be really interested to hear. Thanks. There, there is a fair bit of work on the anthropology of childhood among hunter gatherers, and there are implications there for language. For, for instance, uh, Hadza children who are hunter gathering um, by age five are, are collecting 50% of their own food, spending most of their time with their peers. So they're mostly learning language from other children. Now, if they were learning language, if they were hanging out with children who spoke other languages in, in the in prehistoric past, that could have had different types of language contact patterns than you'd see between language contact with adults. And in fact, there's a, a paper about a a sort of Creole language they call Kisisi. It was just based on one Swahili speaking boy and I think an either English or German speaking child who played with one another and they created their own language. Um, I'll look for the references for that. So, you know, I think we need to have a lot of hypotheses when we're talking about prehistory because the social conditions could have been vastly different than what we see today and individuals making individual choices, you know. Could have been very different so yeah just and and also just remembering that the hadza and other hunter gatherers tend to have a lot of personal autonomy and freedom so there isn't like oh you can't say that our language doesn't do that people are like yeah this person speaks that way so let them do it there's a lot of um back for different people's choices so i think that would reflect in language as well that's really interesting i'll write this all down thank you so much and up. Well, there, one more, there is a, uh, there was an NSF pro um, funded proposal uh, looking at languages of hunter gatherers and they have a website, but it doesn't have any African hunter gatherers on it. And I, as I recall, it got kind of mixed. Uh, like there wasn't a whole lot that looked particularly hunter gathery about languages, but let me just put that here. Here's the link in the chat for people to go look at that and see some of the publications. Um, Claire Bowern was one of the people um, having some of those publications such as, if you give me a second, I'll, I'll put some of the more hunter gathery ones in the chat as well. So for instance, here's one about questioning might uh, there be different patterns of um, borrowing in hunter-gatherer languages, for instance. And then of course, there's the uh, whole edited volume on hunter-gatherer languages that I believe is in the um, Rift Valley bibliography. But again, remembering that most of our understanding of hunter-gatherers comes from modern hunter-gatherers and things may have been different in the past and um, yeah, therefore 
patterns of language contact and change may have been different in the past as well. A little yeah. bit. I don't mean to be anti-uniformitarian there, but. <laughs> yeah, of course, you need to start somewhere because if you operate under that assumption, then what's really the point of this type of research? Um, but of course, it's very, very important to keep that in mind that it shouldn't reflect anything we know as of today. Yeah, but just a basic assumption, which is really a linguistic ideology we might have, which is that children might want to speak like adults at some point. Well, maybe they don't. Maybe like teenagers, they want to develop their own style. You know, we don't know anything really about style and hunter-gatherer languages and creativity and that sort of thing. All right, thank you. Then I think I will wrap it up. Um, so Nina, thank you for your presentation. I look forward to uh, what the future is going to bring in your research, particularly when you get also the archaeological and ecological data in. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that recordings of all of the presentations in the Rift Valley webinar series can be found on the Rift Valley Network YouTube page. And the entries for each presentation are added to the Rift Valley Bibliography. Um, the next webinar will be on Wednesday, the 9th of February, and it will be presented by Julia Stachy and Hannah Gibson. And the title and abstract will be announced uh, at a later time via the newsletter. So uh, Nina, thank you again, and of course everyone else for participating today, and I hope to see you again at our next webinar.